Cheers, guys, and welcome to Uncle Scott's Pancast. <laughs> Woo! Got a lot going on in the old Pancast today. We are talking stove. Well, then we'll cast iron, uh, some carbon steel. Going to have a few tips, answer some carbon steel questions. We're going to talk beef and what you guys think about short ribs versus chuck roast. We're going to talk eggs, sliding eggs. Got some feedback on that egg sliding video I did the other day and more. Let's jump in and get started. Uh, what I want to start with today is stove. I have really been enjoying my stove enamel cast iron and I'm kind of getting into it. I've got four pieces so far and I've been buying some stove stuff. I've got some of the decorative knobs, some of the utensils, uh, lid holder, but what I recently added was this guy. And this is a stove cookbook. Now I've never reviewed a cookbook before, so we're gonna do a quick cookbook review here at the top and see how it goes. What I like about this stove cookbook is that every recipe kind of tells you which piece of cookware it is optimized for. Um, it's got color pictures. And what I like about color pictures in a cookbook, especially if, if I'm making a recipe I've never made before, if I just read a recipe and make it, I don't know what it's supposed to look like. So I like having the color pictures in here so that when I make a recipe, I know if I, if I did it correctly or not. Good things like beef bourguignon, it's got all kinds of desserts, cobblers, really heavy type foods, but absolutely fantastic cookbook. So if you're into stove stuff, I give this a thumbs up. Um, these recipes would obviously work with other brands of cookware, but if you had Lake Crusade or Lodge and made a recipe out of the stove book, would you feel good about yourself? Now, I recently made the beer braised short ribs along with some of the polenta uh, out of this book, and they both turned out fantastically. You might notice, and this might annoy my third grade teacher, but I wrote in my book in pen. Anytime I make a recipe out of a cookbook, I write down everything. I write down the date, whether people liked it or not, any kind of tasting notes, any types of changes. And one of the changes I made to this recipe the second time I made it was I changed from short ribs to chuck roast. Short ribs might as well be made out of gold these days. They're very expensive. And I had about five, between five and six pounds of short ribs for that recipe. And just the ribs alone were almost $50. So some of these, these braising type recipes, they're often listed as kind of peasant food. And if you pay $50 for just one ingredient, if you're not a peasant when you start, you will be by the time you are done. The chuck rose usually have some connective tissue. And I do often use the chuck rose for these longer, slower cooking recipes uh, like beef stew um, for proposal. We've talked about proposal several times recently. And for these beer braised short ribs, anything, especially the beef that's going to cook for two and a half, three, three and a half hours, plenty of time for the uh, collagen and connective tissue in those, those roasts to break down and become really tender. And I got to say, I think I'm going to mostly, except for when a recipe specifically really calls for a short ribs, if it's a short rib recipe, I'll use short ribs, but I am mostly using uh, cubed up chuck roast these days in place of short ribs. Now I think both have great flavor, but with that cost, and when you factor in the bones, I think the value is a lot greater with the chuck roast than with the short ribs. I put up a poll and asked you guys what you think about the uh, short ribs and over 430 people voted. Pretty good turnout there. And I asked which you guys prefer for braising short ribs, chuck roast, or whatever they put in Denty Moore. Uh, I know Denny Moore is the funny answer, but uh, in college and grad school, there's no telling how much Denty Moore beef stew um, I ate to survive. Uh, short ribs won 50% and chuck roast 42%. So here I am kind of in the minority with chuck roast at 42%. Kind of interesting. 
A couple other poll results we might as well talk about while we're talking polls. I put up another question. What is the oldest piece of cookware you actually use? Um, 640 people voted in this one, and I had zero to five years, 12%, six to 10 years, 17%, 11 to 20 years, 17% as well, over 20 years old. And I said these were kind of de facto heirlooms already or soon to be. 54% of you guys have a piece of cookware that's over 20 years old that you actually use. I have some of those as well. Um, some of the carbon steels that we talk about often around here, um, I haven't been using them long enough, but I think eventually those are gonna become kind of modern versions of some of the cast iron perhaps. I've got a cast iron skillet, uh, I need to restore it a little bit, but it's from my great grandfather and I think it's 75, 80 years old. I expect some of these carbon steels to be in that category down the road from now. And the final poll I had up, over 900 of you guys voted in this one. And I asked, which do you think is worse for your health? Cooking in a chemical coated nonstick skillet? Cooking with butter in a regular pan? I get a lot of uh, feedback about the amount of butter I use around here. And stress from worrying too much about what you eat. Believe it or not, cooking in a chemical coated nonstick, 42% of you guys said that was the worst out of the three. Only 4% said cooking with butter. And this surprised me because it's kind of the funny answer, but this one turned out to be number one. Stress from worrying too much about what you eat, 55%. So you guys think stress is worse for your health than any of the other answers. And I kind of agree with that too. Stress is a killer. Okay, let's talk carbon steel. And specifically, here I have a Maffer pan and a Debouille pan, both uh, crepe pans, carbon steel. And believe it or not, this week I get in a couple of carbon steel pan crepe questions, crepe pan questions. Let's see. And we'll kind of use these to give out a few carbon steel tips and tricks here. First, Matthew Upton, 3813, wrote in and asked about using metal utensils. Uh, he saw in a video I was using a metal utensil in a carbon steel crate pan. Is that okay? It is definitely okay to use metal, not only in crate pans, but any of your other carbon steel skillets. If you have kind of a work of art pan that you're using only for eggs and it's got a, like a mirror, shiny, dark black surface and you don't want to use the, uh, the uh, metal utensils, that, that's understandable, but it's not going to hurt anything. And if you've got a working pan, you can just use those metal utensils as much as you want. And if it puts tiny scratches in your pan, just know that lots of people think that the next time you season your pan, those little scratches, they give something for that seasoning to kind of latch onto. So no big deal at all using metal pans. In the case of the crepe pan, if you wanna be really traditional, you can use one of these. This is more of a uh, dedicated crepe, a spatula or turner, I'm not sure exactly what you call it, but this is what my wife uses and she makes crepes twice a week. So if you wanna be traditional, don't use metal, use the uh, wood. Also along those lines, uh, Gox, Goxie Eagle 8446 wrote in and said he has a Debouille uh, crepe pan and he's getting some rusting and crepes stick to the surface. So that sent up some red flags for me right there because we have a Debouille crepe pan, which we use all the time and no rusting and our crepes are non-stick. So I wrote him back and asked him what was going on and if he's leaving that pan wet. And he wrote back and said, well, I wash it and I have to let it dry. That is a no-no right there. So the first thing here, why he's probably getting the rust on his carbon steel is he's washing the pan, which is fine. You can wash carbon steel. What it seems like he is not doing is he's not drying the pan. So if you wash a carbon steel skillet, I would use hot water and I would have a towel ready and I would dry it immediately after you wash it. Don't put it in the dish rack and let it drip dry for a half hour. Dry that thing with a towel and then put it on a burner. And 
what I do is put it on a gas burner and heat it for 20, 30 seconds. Not very long, but just enough to heat it up a little bit and evaporate off any remaining moisture. And I'm gonna give you a tip here that is one of the key carbon steel tips you will ever hear. And a lot of people don't ever mention doing this. Um, after your pan is dry, we all talk about putting a few drops of oil on the pan. And wiping those around is kind of a protective coat. If you put your pan on a stovetop burner and heat it up to get rid of that remaining moisture, wait for it to cool down to room temperature before you add the protective oil. If you put protective oil on a moderately hot pan, one that is not hot enough to season properly, what you're doing is essentially doing a halfway seasoning. That oil will get sticky and gunky and you'll start out with a nice non-stick carbon steel. Clean it, do that, put your oil on a hot pan, it gets gunky, you come back the next time and you wonder what happened to my pan, why is it sticky? It's because you didn't let it cool down to room temperature before you added your protective oil. Now, as far as crepes sticking, I'm not an expert, but my wife makes them twice a week. And what she does, and I think she may have learned this from a Jacques Pepin video, is she takes a stick of butter and just sticks it on the, uh, the crepe pan as it's heating up and that butter melts around and she melts butter all around the pan as the pan is heating up. Then she takes that melted butter, pours it into the batter, stirs that around. So then you've got a hot crepe pan with hot butter on it and you've got hot butter in the batter and she pours that into the uh, carbon steel crepe pan and they don't stick at all. So as usual, heat and butter do work wonders for non-stick cooking. Um, I forgot the screen name, I'll have to look it up, but a guy from, that was born in Abruzzo, Italy wrote in and we were talking back and forth about some Italian things and he mentioned in the pan cast, I always start with the toast, he encouraged me and asked me to toast with some grappa. Now I live in Utah and I went to the liquor store today and I use the state liquor store app. There is no grappa, no Italian grappa in Utah. As a matter of fact, the only bottle I could find was a grappa from Oregon. And I don't think that kind of fits the bill of what we were talking about. So I didn't buy the grappa. I'm gonna see if I can track some down or special order some and we will do grappa, uh, toast with some grappa in a future episode. If you've never had grappa before or grappa, it is essentially, not exactly, but kind of Italian moonshine. At least some of the stuff I had in Italy um, came out in a bottle with no label on it. And I think one of the guys had made it himself. If you get some of the uh, processed grappa, it is liquor, um, usually a clear liquor made from fermented uh, wine grape stems, believe it or not. So they turn that into an, to an after dinner digestive. Instead, what I'm doing today is Sipping on a little, where is it? High West, a rendezvous, uh, blended straight rye whiskey. And I thought this one might be kind of neat because it is actually made in Utah. So let's give this a sip. It's pretty doggone good. Might want to mix that with something later. A pretty good uh, bold flavor there, nice stuff. Now let's talk about eggs. I put up a video the other day um, showing how I like to get nonstick eggs in various skillets, usually uh, carbon steel, but other skillets as well. And as often happens, when we talk about eggs, we get lots of feedback. Got a lot of feedback on that video. There were kind of several buckets of comments. Most people enjoyed the video. Lots of people from Europe wrote in and said they don't refrigerate their eggs. Um, one of the tips in the video was to take your eggs out of the refrigerator, let them warm up just a little bit. That, I guess, is mostly for North America, for America, uh, maybe Canada, I'm not sure. But most of our eggs are refrigerated. They come from the grocery store refrigerated. We keep them in the refrigerator. Now, if you have backyard chickens, it's a different story. If you grew up on a farm, different story. My father-in-law in New Jersey used to have, I think, 19 backyard chickens. And when I go visit there, we had about the freshest eggs you could possibly get. And those were definitely room temperature. But your standard supermarket egg in North America is usually, not always, but usually refrigerated. 
And if you have refrigerated eggs, especially if you're new and learning how to get nonstick eggs, I think it really does help to let those warm up a little bit. Now, if you're in Europe and your eggs are room temperature to begin with, you're already ahead of the game. And along those lines, I really wish we could kind of get European food standard food here in the United States. A lot of our stuff, I don't, I don't know what they put in it. I go to Europe, um, especially Italy. I chow down on heavy, delicious food. I drink a lot of wine and I lose weight. And if you come back to America and just eat stuff from the grocery store, it's like I'm always working out. I'm trying to lose weight. I'm on a diet and it just seems to not work. So maybe they put something in our food, who knows? Or maybe I just need to get out from behind the computer and get a little more exercise. Second bucket of comments about the video tend to fall in some version of, it takes too long. There's too many steps. Uh, what you're saying to do in that video it takes too long. I don't have enough time to do that in the morning just for an egg. Uh, let's remember that when you're new, you might need a little extra help and hand-holding and to do things in a little bit more meticulous detail. Once you get the hang of it, it goes a lot quicker. But let's remember we were all new to carbon steel or cast iron or whatever pan we're using at some point. We had to learn how it cooks. And with uh, carbon steel especially, there are issues with seasoning early on and you got to get used to your pan. And some people, and we were all there at one point, need a little extra hand holding and a little bit extra detail at first. If you're already an expert, you probably didn't need the video to begin with. Let's see, just John Music Channel 8327 wrote in and asked about using ghee for cooking eggs. Can you use ghee? Of course you can use ghee. And I don't want to get the ghee versus clarified butter debate going here. But in the, uh, the video where I reviewed that 11 inch Debouille Mineral B, um, omelet pan, I did use, I used a little bit of peanut oil, but I put some clarified butter in there. And it works very well. And I think if you use the clarified butter, you get a little bit more wiggle room sometimes because there's nothing in there to brown. So you don't have to worry about your butter browning as much if you get the, uh, the heat up a little bit too fast. But at the same time, when you're learning, you also don't get the indicators with the clarified butter or the ghee. That water content of the butter, as I mentioned in the egg video, um, as the butter bubbles and crackles, that is steam and water evaporating away out of that butter. And it kind of regulates the temperature of the pan. That steam takes away some heat. And when the crackling and bubbling stops, that's a great indicator for when to add your eggs. So you don't get those with the ghee or the clarified butter, but you can get delicious eggs with them. You just have to work on your timing. Let's see, Nurch77 wrote in, and he is saying that, thank you, with your help, I managed to cook nonstick eggs in my debouille. So way to go there. He's got nonstick eggs. Um, that's using butter. But when he tries to use sunflower oil, the eggs stick. So nonstick with butter, sticking with sunflower oil. What is the problem? More than likely, it's a preheating and pan temperature issue. That's what I would change first. I would go with a little bit more heat. Um, with the butter, you get those indicators, as we mentioned. With sunflower oil, you're not gonna be able to tell exactly when to add your eggs, so you're gonna need to experiment a little and work on your timing. And you should be able to figure out, well, I need to preheat this pan for a minute in 45 seconds to two minutes, then add my egg. So work on your timing, and I bet, you will get those eggs to slide. Robert Holden, 417, wrote in, and this is one of the uh, comments that kind of illustrates one of the reasons I do these videos around here. He says, thank you for all your videos on carbon steel. I have thrown away perfectly good cast iron and carbon steel pans in the past just because I didn't understand how to use them and protect them. Oh man, that's kind of sad there. Uh, he said they eventually rusted or became more of a burden than a tool that I wanted to bother with. Now he has two Mineral B Pros that he uses daily thanks to Uncle Scott's Kitchen and what he's learned here. And he says he finds himself cooking just because he wants to use the pan sometimes. So that really makes me happy. The tips that we throw out around here, they actually do work. And I've had versions of this email before where people are ready to throw their pans away, but they do what we say to do around here. 
and it works and they get sliding eggs and nonstick food and really enjoy cooking in their carbon steel after that. So congratulations to Robert Holden for getting his carbon steel sorted out. Red I3 wrote in talking about carbon steel seasoning. And one of the older videos I have up, it still gets a lot of traffic. He says, this was a four-year-old video. Seasoning techniques have changed and people prefer the oven method now. And I've, sh I've shown the oven method in several videos and the oven method is fine, especially um, if you have an electric flat top or an induction stove, that oven method may be the best to use. I still like using the stovetop method. Uh, it's quick and it's easy and I'm going to do this in a future video. I can take a brand new carbon steel skillet, something like a Debouillet, um, a mat for if you have to do the potato peels, oil and salt, we won't get into that. It takes a little bit longer. But something like a Debouillet where it's just washing out some beeswax and doing a stovetop seasoning, I can go from pack, pan in the packaging to ready to cook except for the cool down in less than 15 minutes. If I'm on my game, about 10 minutes, I'm ready to go and start cooking. So I like that uh, better than the oven method, but the oven method works just fine. Okay, look on this screen for links to other pancasts you might enjoy. Thank you for watching. We'll see you again next time on Uncle Scott's Pancast.